Where can I go from Your Spirit, O God? If I ascend to heaven, You are there. If I descend to the depths, You are there. Wherever I go, O God, You are with me in ever-present time. The Lord knows us by name and will not forsake us. The Lord is ever faithful. And so we lift our songs glad thanks to Please be seated. The Apostle Paul tells us that the proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we might, might find mercy and grace in our time of need. Let us confess our sin. Forgive us, O oh God, for our determination to run from you to hide from you, to think life without you is better than life with you, and to seek our own way. Forgive us for our sins of commission and omission, for the things we've done and failed to do, for falling prey to temptation, but for stubbornly resisting the urge of your spirit. It would not surprise us if you gave up on us, O God. 
What is even more surprising is that you haven't, and that in Jesus Christ you have pursued us with a persistence and a determination that humbles us. Overwhelm us with your grace, O God, that we might be restored into your presence and know the joy you intend for us through Christ our Lord. The psalmist declares the Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises all up all who are bowed down. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And friends in Christ, in response to this gift of God's grace, how then shall we live? With gratitude, following after the Lord Jesus Christ who calls us to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. This is the way of Jesus in whom we find life. be seated. Y'all, y'all, I want to ask you as our special guest to uh, do what we did at the early service and come uh, stand out here so the congregation can see who we've been talking about, thinking about, and praying for. What you're seeing before you is what I'm calling an international multi-continent group of visitors, uh, mission partners uh, with us and we with them. Uh, uh, in our uh, ministry to uh, Santa Cruz, Bolivia. There may be others like this going on in the world, but I don't know of another one where a congregation from Korea reached out to a congregation in the United States to join in partnership to do mission together uh, on a third continent. And so, but that's what you're seeing here. Uh, uh, we, we hear about this every year, uh, but, but now you're seeing uh, it uh, in real life. Uh, these are some of our uh, mission partners and Charles Peacock is going to have a moment for mission in a little bit about what we're doing in Santa Cruz and with the Eden School so I don't give you a lot of details about that but I wanted you to know generally speaking who uh, has come to be with us and a little bit of why. Uh, Reverend Moon and his wife Marie are leading the trip and they're right up front um, and uh, we've come to know them and love them over the years and, and this uh, visit really uh, was his brainchild to bring others to the United States to see how churches and schools and communities operate. By my count, we have uh, th three other pastors, two from Bolivia and one from Korea and at least one preacher's kid. Um, who is also a, a, a missionary with, with his mother's congregation. We have two dentists from Bolivia. All right, Fred, they're, they're being pointed out to you. We've got a businessman, an engineer, architect, and his three children. Uh, we have a, a school principal. Where's the print? There's the principal. Uh, and I've and I got a few high school boys here, too. All right. Uh, they have been staying with families in our church, experiencing good old uh, uh, southern hospitality. 
but they've also been spending very busy days, again, traveling around. Uh, they spent a, have spent a lot of time here talking to the church staff and, and church members here. They've traveled to some of the outstanding universities we have in our area to simply see uh, uh, what, what a first-rate, world-class educational institution looks like and how it's organized. Uh, they've, they've done some of the cultural things that you might expect them to do. Uh, I think they've had some NC State ice cream. Am I right about that? You can't come to Raleigh without that. And so, but but the, the vision behind all this is that Reverend Moon, uh, while they've accomplished so many great things, uh, has still a greater vision of what they can accomplish. And they, they simply wanted to see how, how we do church and how schools operate and, and how uh, you know, just the, 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 the best opportunities, just best practices. So they have tried to learn from us. Truth be told, we have a lot we could learn from them. I mean, I think anybody who's honest would say that. Uh, but this has been a, a good way for us to build relationships so that when, when you hear us talking about Bolivia, you'll be able to see exactly what we're talking about. These are the folks that, with whom we are in partnership. As I did at the early service, I want to also want to say a thanks to Wanda Easley. I'm going to make you stand up. Wanda uh, has been one of our uh, mission partners on these uh, mission experiences for a long time, fluent in Spanish, and so she has been a lifesaver uh, for those of us who are not. Uh, and we've also, some of the young people in this group are multilingual. They have also served as uh, translators, uh, and, and Bill and Laura Miller's son has also been helpful in do some translation work. Uh, Wanda has actually gone to the trouble of translating the elements of worship today uh, into Spanish so that our Spanish-speaking folks can be full participants in our worship experience this morning. Uh, though I think a lot of these folks know our hymns by heart, and so they'll be singing them in their own uh, tongues, but uh, Wanda had the unenviable task of taking, I had to finish my sermon early this week so I could get it to her so that she could translate it. And what I said at the early service, if you don't understand it, see Wanda, she can translate it into better English, uh, perhaps, uh, for you. But we've been uh, so enriched by your presence here. I know that our host families have loved having you under their roofs and at, uh, at their dinner tables. And, and many of us have had opportunities to greet you and welcome you. And um, uh, many of you came to us as strangers, but you return uh, as friends. And, the, and that's the best part of mission is, uh, is us being in mission together. And so we are so glad to have you with us and share in mission with you. God bless you. For over 20 years, First Presbyterian Church has been part of a spiritual triangle that stretches from Raleigh to Korea to Bolivia. What started out as a cultural exchange between members of the Sunan Presbyterian Church in Kwangju, Korea, and First Presbyterian has grown to include 10 missionary trips to the Eden School and mission of Reverend Iqbai Moon in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. In 1994, the Sunan Church began supporting Reverend Moon. At that time, he had already established 20 mission churches in and around Santa Cruz, and by 2000, he had established five more. The Sunam Church wanted him to emulate Presbyterian missionaries from the U.S. who originally brought Christianity to Korea in the 1880s. These missionaries had three goals. One, preach the gospel. Two, educate the flock. And three, establish community health care with clinics and hospitals. The Sunam Church built the Eden School for Reverend Moon. With our help, it has been possible to support the Eden School and set up a seminary and healthcare facility for Eden in the surrounding neighborhood. And First Presbyterian members have generously given to support the building and equipping of the healthcare and dental facility. In 2001, individual members of First Presbyterian began supporting the Eden School 
by providing scholarships for Eden students in grades K through 12. Since 2004, First Presbyterian has established a 35 capacity computer laboratory for the school and sent a shipping container to equip the dental and medical clinics. Starting in 2005, FPC has since sent mission teams 10 times to Eden bringing dental, medical, and vision clinics that have treated over 25,000 patients. The Eden Dental and Medical Clinics now function year-round for Eden students and the surrounding neighbors, adding greatly to Reverend Moon's ministry. Through the efforts of the Sunam Presby Korean Presbyterian Church and First Presbyterian, Reverend Moon's ministry has been supplemented by adding classroom and medical buildings, funding Christian-oriented education, and providing valuable health care services for the Bolivians. It has and will continue to be a vibrant mission for the Koreans, First Presbyterian members, and many Bolivians. There are a number of ways to be involved in this important international outreach program. Educational scholarships. Currently, a full scholarship to send a child to the Eden School for the entire school year is just $400. Full or partial scholarships are also welcomed. Contributions are needed by December the 31st for the school year, which starts in February. Reverend Moon identifies students and their families that have a need for help and interviews them to determine their commitment to education and their commitment to Jesus Christ. You can join us for a mission trip. Don't think that you would not find a place to serve. More hands are always welcomed in all of the clinics. Help collect supplies. While we are limited in what we can take through customs, some articles are allowed, and if you would like to help, contact one of us who have been on a recent trip. The Eden School truly is an oasis of Christian-oriented education in the midst of a very poor neighborhood. Our scholarship program has given hope to many children who now have the chance to be strong Christian leaders in Bolivia's future. We still need to assist with education at the K-12 level and need to further equip the Eden Clinic and put it on a firm footing by ensuring the retention of high-quality Bolivian clinic personnel. Through your generosity and involvement, we can keep this mission project a very meaningful, vibrant, caring part of our ministry at First Presbyterian. Any of us who have been on past mission teams will be happy to talk with you about this wonderful outreach program. Thank you. We have already named one of our great joys this morning as a community of faith, and that is uh, welcoming and being in partnership with these folks who have stood before you. And so certainly we lift up praises to God for those relationships and the way that God is at work in them. A couple of concerns to raise to your attention before we pray together. Uh, one is that Alice Moore tripped at the gym last week, and unfortunately she broke her right hand, her right foot, and sprained her right ankle. So she is hobbling around a little bit, and so we want to offer our prayers for her uh, healing, her recovery. Uh, Dot Hoover has also been in the hospital over the past couple of days. Uh, she covets your prayers for her recovery. She requests no visitors uh, or no phone calls at this time. It sort of wears her out, but she does uh, love to know that her church family is thinking about her and praying for her. Um, and our prayers are with Hazel Horner this morning as she grieves the loss of her sister, Virginia Maxwell, who died this week. Mindful that there are other concerns and joys that we carry in our hearts, let us take those silent prayer concerns as well as the ones I've spoken to you uh, to God now in a time of prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, our source of healing and renewal, we gather today to claim a place in your creation to rekindle our hearts in the gift of your love. You are our God and we are your people. And you have given us Jesus, who frees us and reconciles you to the whole creation. Show us your presence in and among us as we pray together this morning. For we know that where two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst of us. And so we give you thanks that your love and compassion reach through our unfaithful behavior to welcome us again into your embrace, and that you promise to transform our hearts and cleanse us from sin. You are the Good Shepherd, O God. And as we follow you, you call each of us to shepherd some small flock, a family or workplace or community, to walk with others as we follow you, to help others get the nourishment and rest and shelter that they need to live and thrive, to help those who have been lost to return and to reconnect. And so, O oh Lord, we lift up to you all those in our world who go without adequate food, 
who work so hard and hardly have the time to sleep, those who are stretched too thin, and those who are in periods of transition. You love each of us as honored children made in your image. Help us so to love one another in word, deed, and thought. We ask for your tender mercies this morning to surround those who are grieving this day, those who miss a beloved or a friend, those who experience loss of all kinds. Comfort them by your grace, O God, and draw us ever nearer to one another in fellowship, particularly mindful of those who are in need of steady friendship in these days. Be with those who are sick, those who await test results, and those whose health is always a source of anxiety. And strengthen those who care for the sick, that they might be rooted in your compassion and grounded in your steady mercy. We pray for those this morning for whom this date is a difficult anniversary each and every year, because it brings back the pain of loss, the pain of fear, the memory of terrorism. Heal the rifts that divide humanity, O God. Make us your faithful people, more bent on serving and honoring neighbor than recoiling from others in fear, and building barriers that only serve to hem us in and separate us from one another. We pray especially for all those charged with the safety and care of others, that you would keep them in safety too, that you would be present with them as they carry out their important work. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite all the children to come down and join me for a moment together. Good morning. Oh, I love all these faces. This is a good-looking crowd. How are you today? Good? I'm going to, so Jack M. here is my go-to guy for having the stuff. If you need stuff, he's going to be our guy. And he is going to let everybody, when we go, pick out our art as offering piece. I want to remind you that not only do we have our worship bags back there, but we have art as offering that I'm asking all of you to take a slip every week color it while you're listening to the service, and then put it in the offering plate. It will go up on our wall right next to our TVs down in the lobby for a couple weeks. And then we're gonna send them off to people who might need a happy note, might be in the hospital, might be sick. You're going to offer up something beautiful to somebody who needs it. So I brought these up here in the front and Jack will help you get one at the end. But I want to read to you just one verse of our Bible, our New Testament Bible story this morning, and ask you to think about something as we go on to Children's Church or we go back to our pews. Listen to this comes from the book of Luke, one of our Gospels, New Testament. Very first verse says, Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. I like the word grumbling. So we have on one side, we have tax collectors and sinners. These are people that everybody thought were bad. They didn't want to be around them. They thought they made bad choices. They were just not, 
not people that anyone wanted to hang out with. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were the law men. They thought that they knew everything there was to know about God's law and that they kept it just like they were supposed to and that they were generally thinking they were better than everybody else. So what happens is Jesus walks in on the scene and who does he go to? Does he go sit down with the Pharisees and the guys that everybody's supposed to like? Based on just those two verses, where does he go? He goes to the other people. He goes and sits down with everyone that people say you're not supposed to hang out with because they're just not as good as I am. Do we, have, do we ever have problems remembering that we're supposed to love everybody instead of just those people that we think are like us, look like us, act like us? Do we ever have trouble with that? Let me tell you, I have trouble with that all the time. I'm going to be honest. I have trouble loving everyone who comes into my world. But you know what Jesus shows us in, this, in this, these two verses, and then if you stay in the sanctuary, you'll hear a lot more about it. Our job is not to sit around and love just the people right in front of us or just the people that look like us or just the people that act like us. Our job is to love everyone, and that's not easy, but it's our job. And you're going to go out into the world, you're gonna go out into the world, and you're gonna remind us grown-ups, because I think you know how to love those that are hard to love. I think sometimes us grown-ups need that as a good reminder, don't we? Not easy, I'm not telling you it's easy, but it's what Jesus did, and it's what Jesus asks us to do. Will you pray with me? I'll say it, then you say it. God of love, thank you for giving us a hard job and the tools we need to do it. Amen. If you would like an a artist offering sheet, if you are in kindergarten, first or second grade, I will meet you at that door. Thanks, friend. The first reading comes from the prophet Hosea, uh, chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. It's on page 842 of your pew Bible. But first, let us pray. O Lord, in this place, quicken us by your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is read and proclaimed, it may become real and alive in our hearts and minds. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went to me. They kept sacrificing, went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to the idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I had healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bonds of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities. It consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeroim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst. 
and I will not come in wrath. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. text this morning give us some insight into what God does with the wayward. The text from Hosea spoke to that and we now turn to Luke's record of the gospel, the 15th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Listen again to God's word for us. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. And again, let us pray. Be at work among us, O God, with the gift of your Spirit, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I wonder if you're familiar with the five-second rule. The five-second rule is that if you drop a piece of food on the floor and pick it up within five seconds and blow it off, you're good to go. Unless it goes jelly side down. Now this is not an official endorsement of the five-second rule, nor an admission that I've ever done this myself. Only an acknowledgement that in some households, this is a part of the dining protocol. Actually, in our house, we've always had a dog. No piece of food has ever lasted on the floor more than five seconds. So the five-second rule in our house is moot, though our molly is slowing down a bit. So that's the five-second rule. The next question is whether you are familiar with the five-minute rule. This is a much more specific rule, one that emerges from the game of golf. As rule 27-C states that if you hit an errant shot, you have five minutes to find and identify your ball. If you haven't found it in five minutes, you have to suspend your search, take a one-stroke penalty, and play a new ball from the spot where you think your old ball should have been. That's the rule, but here's the truth about this. Some golfers give up on their lost ball way before five minutes. People like me, people who play very cheap golf balls, do a cost-benefit analysis, and having peered into the woods where poison ivy and snakes reside, we toss a new ball down on the ground and we keep on playing. Some people give up their search early because they're not sure they want to find it because you have to play it from where you find it, and they know it might be in a tree trunk or behind a rock. So it's simpler just to declare it lost, take a penalty, and keep on going. The rule is in place for those folks who might keep looking forever, the folks who spend $50 a dozen for golf balls. The five-minute rule is in place to limit on limit a search on the assumption that if you can't find it in five minutes, you're not likely to find it. 
But there is no five minute rule on the rest of life. So how long we might search for something that is lost is always dependent on how much we value it. A few weeks ago, my cell phone slipped out of my pocket in a movie theater. I didn't realize it was gone until I got in my car to drive away, so I had to talk my way back into the movie theater so I could go look for it. And it took me a while to find it. I generally knew where we had been sitting, but it was a black, back black phone on a black floor in a dark theater. And, so, and I'm a good moviegoer. I could have had Jenny call the phone, but before the movie, I turned the phone off like you're supposed to do. But by the, I, I searched for a few minutes, and I was already beginning to calculate the time and effort and money it was going to take to replace the phone because I knew I couldn't look forever. They were about to start the next showing, and I knew they wouldn't allow me to keep poking around in here for my phone. But then I found it. Just before I was about to give up my search, I found it but I wasn't gonna look forever, it was just a phone. But let's up the ante a bit. What if you'd lost a pet? This has happened to some of you. How long do you look? How long do you wander the neighborhood calling its name? How long do you look? How long will you search? Will you search a day, two days, a week? But even when you give up, don't you have this nagging feeling that if you just looked a little longer, you might have been able to bring her home? But what if you're, you're looking for is not a cell phone or a pet? What if, what if what is lost is a child or a grandchild? How long would you look? Would you ever stop looking? Would you ever rest until this thing that you loved more than life itself has been found? I always think it must be a terribly wrenching moment after one of those plane crashes or boat capsizes when the people running the rescue mission say they've moved from a rescue mission to a recovery mission because I know what that means. It means they've given up hope of ever finding anybody alive. Though my guess is that the families, if they have the time and the means and the resources, I bet they keep on looking, keep on hoping, keep on searching. There's a little word in Luke's gospel. It's a little word, a three-letter word that Luke uses when he tells the story of the shepherd and the lost sheep and the woman and the lost coin. It's a little word, eos. Eos. And it means until. He uses it twice. He says that the shepherd who lost the sheep looked until he found it. And the woman who lost the coin looked until she found it. Implying in both cases that this search was not going to be prematurely suspended. This search was not going to be called off. This search was going to keep on going until, until the lost thing had been found, recovered restored. Actually, that's what makes these stories a little preposterous. Actually, we're, that's how we're supposed to read them because it's only one sheep. The shepherd had 99 more and it's only one coin, higher stakes of course, but the woman apparently didn't need this coin for her survival because she spent more than the value of that coin throwing a party to celebrate its recovery. There is a nonsensical nature about these stories that Jesus tells. He is supposed to, he's supposed to be telling this story to show the irrationality and absurdity of this kind of search, a search that should have been reasonably suspended, but a search that goes on and on and on and on until the lost thing is found. The searcher searches until. The shepherd searches until. The woman searches until. 
But not until they got bored, not until they became tired, not until they counted the cost and decided the search was no longer worth it, they searched until the sheep was found. They searched until the coin was restored. It's a little word. Eos. Until. Until this precious thing is no longer out there lost somewhere. But is safe. Restored. At home. These stories were meant initially to challenge the notion of the Pharisees. It's what Catherine just told the children. To challenge the notion of the Pharisees that some people are outside of the scope of God's concern. Now the Pharisees knew they were inside the scope. They knew they were God's cherished people. But they were also pretty sure they knew who the outsiders were, and it troubled them to see Jesus drawn to the sinners, the unclean and the unworthy. And so Jesus told them these stories. And Jesus lived his life to demonstrate just how far God would go in pursuit of what God loved. That God, it seems, will search and search and search and search until, until the lost is found. Until the wandering and wayward are brought back where they belong. It's such a little word. Eos. Until. But it is a powerful way of thinking about God's persistence. It's a powerful way of thinking about God's determined, unwavering persistence. Which is what stirred in the heart of God and was made flesh in Jesus Christ. On this 15th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, I decided to do something particular. I decided to look up the list of names of first responders who died that day. Firefighters, police officers, EMTs, people who ran toward the danger hoping to save those who were in peril. I had forgotten, if, if I had ever known, that of the approximately 3,000 people who were killed that day, 411 were first responders. People who put themselves at risk. For other people, they likely didn't know. Now, I don't care to remember the names of the perpetrators of the attacks. But I have decided that I want to remember at least one of the names of those who searched until, who did not give up, who did not weigh the relative merits of running into a burning building, but did so out of a simple concern that there might be somebody in that burning building who could be found rescued and saved. Think about that. That is a remarkable impulse. It goes against every human inclination towards self-preservation. To sacrifice oneself for the sake of others. It goes against every selfish motive that too often guides us. Which is why I think they are worth remembering today. So the name I've chosen to commit to memory is the name Michael Judge, a fire department chaplain who died giving comfort to others rather than seeking his own comfort at some safe distance.
When I think of him and the others, it occurs to me that the best impulses of the human heart, those that lead us to selflessness and and sacrifice and unconditional love, those best impulses of the human heart are rooted in God's own being. And they are perfectly reflected in the person of Jesus Christ. The one who came in search of us demonstrating that God has not given up on us, but instead, like a shepherd in search of a sheep and a woman in search of a coin, searches, 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 searches until we are found, until we are restored, until we are where God wants us to be, Because it's clear to me that the one place God doesn't want us to be is lost. It turns out that God won't rest as long as even one is lost. If that doesn't strike you as good news, then I've either done a lousy job of explaining it or you haven't taken seriously how deeply you are indebted to God's grace. I don't know if it dawned on you while you were listening to the parables, but we are all either the sheep or the coin or both. We have all either wandered away from the shepherd Or maybe most of us are like the coin, and since we're still in the house, we don't think of ourselves as lost. But we are. Until we are found. So all of us are one or the other, or both. But the key to this story is not the lostness of the sheep, or the lostness of the coin. The key to this story is the persistence of the searcher. The determination of the searcher. The fact that the one who comes in search of us apparently has his heart set on us. which is the best news I know. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, let us remain standing and say what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. With generous hearts, let us bring our gifts to God.
Loving God, you who have sought us out, you who, like a mother, cannot forget her nursing child, and a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, you are worthy of our praise and our deepest devotion. And so, O oh God, we return to you, giving our whole lives along with these gifts that we present to you this morning, and ask that you would strengthen us for the work of discipleship as we rest in your all-sufficient grace, and use these offerings to your glory for the sake of your holy name. Amen. Remember, as an act of hospitality, we're going to let our guests uh, make their way to the food lines first. You follow after them and, and enjoy uh, eating with them and meeting them. But before we go from this place, remember this. We are loved with an everlasting love by a God who has pursued us at great cost. Trust that good news and be at peace and live your life in response to it. And may grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessing of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and abide with you, with those you love and with God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.